I am now distinctly honored to introduce our 2016 commencement speaker. Here on campus, you could legitimately address our guest as Dr. Ryan, since Carthage awarded him an honorary doctorate 10 years ago this month. Since that time, undoubtedly due to his Carthage honor, the world <laughs> has come to know him as Speaker of the United States House of Representatives. As an institution of learning, we fervently endorse the exploration of competing views that continually breathes life into our democracy and dares us to ask the tough questions of one another and of ourselves. But this is a day to remove our political hats and park them under our chairs, not literally, keep your hats on. It is a rare privilege to personally and, and hear and learn from a government official of our guest stature. Serving as Speaker of the House carries a host of imperative administrative duties that are vital to our democratic process, including the Speaker's ability to control what, when, and in which order legislative measures, measures reach the floor. It also includes the powerful and weighty responsibility of standing second in the order of succession to the United States Presidency. Graduates, Speaker Ryan's remarkable rise from a Wisconsin youth to the nation's most influential lawmaker should energize you to chase your own dreams even if they seem distant as you are seated here today. In 1992, he sat in your place, graduating with a degree in economics and political science from Miami University in Ohio. Speaker Ryan had his own goals and ambitions, but it would have been difficult to predict the heights he would reach even before his 25th year at reunion. On Capitol Hill, he worked his way up as a congressional aide, policy analyst, and legislative director. In 1998, voters in our district elected him to the U.S. House of Representatives at the age of 28. You got seven years, guys. <laughs> Not to content to rely on doctrine, he immersed himself in the intricacies of the federal budget. Drawing on his de detailed knowledge and networking skills, our guests climbed to become chair of the Budget Ways and Means Committee. In 2012, his party nominated him for Vice President of the United States. Then last October, his House colleagues elected him Speaker. Despite his new title and responsibilities, Speaker Ryan continues to represent our first congressional district, including the concerns of Carthage College. He is now serving in his ninth term. Washington inevitably, inevitably consumes much of his time, yet Speaker Ryan remains an affirmed cheesehead. <laughs> he still lives on the same block where he grew up, roughly 70 miles west of here in Janesville. He and his wife, Jana, have three children, Liza, Charlie, and Sam and we're thrilled that they let him spend part of this weekend with us. This morning's Speaker Ryan asked if I would take the usual fee that we spend on our graduation speakers and apply it to student scholarships here at Carthage. <laughs> I've had the great pleasure to be with Speaker Ryan on three or four occasions, had a chance to talk with him a little bit, and I can tell you that uh, I have never met a more genuine and pleasant person. He is just a joy to be around. It's a thrill to have him here today. Let's give a warm Carthage welcome to Speaker of the House, Paul D. Ryan. Dr. Ryan. <laughs> Sounds like a Tom Clancy novel. <laughs> I forgot about that. Uh, Dr. Woodward, thank you very much. To the class of 2016, congratulations. <laughs> this is a big moment in your life. And no matter how much fun you're going to have tonight, you are bound to remember some of it. <laughs> if you forget this speech, no big loss. I'll get over it eventually. <laughs> Just want to remember one thing. Remember the people that got you here. There's an old saying, which I might have just made up a few minutes ago. <laughs> Marriage is for the couple. The wedding, the wedding is for the family. I'd think of your graduation the same way. It's their achievement just as much as it is yours. And yet, 
they have gladly given you all of the credit. So if your mom or your dad or your brother or your sister or your grandparents or your, your cousins, if they get a little teary-eyed, if they let out a few sniffles or they just break down and sob, bear with them. Thank them. Appreciate them. They love you more than you will ever know. <clears throat> to all the faculty, to all the family, I just want to say to you, job well done. Fantastic. This is what gives us all hope of, for the future of our country and our society, our community. You know, it was basically 10 years ago uh, since I spoke at this commencement the last time. And the last time I was here uh, was basically my first encounter as a Catholic with our new then bishop, um, His Eminence, Timothy Cardinal Dolan, who was then the Archbishop of Milwaukee. He did the prayer, I did the speech. I wanted to keep things casual. So my topic was the need for truth in the modern world. As expected, it was a total hit. <laughs> I got wild applause. I mean, cheering, shouting, crying. And that was just from the Archbishop. <laughs> he came up to me. You guys all know Tim Dolan, right? A pretty jovial, funny guy. He came up to me and said, I loved your speech. It was, it was so short. <laughs> and we've been great friends ever since. So if you are feeling a little stir-crazy right now, you're thinking about the rest of the day, you're thinking about the rest of your year or the rest of your life, uh, rest assured, I will get right to the point. The biggest piece of advice that I would give to all of you is this. Don't worry too much about the plan. Go where you can make a difference. Sometimes fulfillment lies in very unpredictable places. All of your life, people are going to hound you about the plan, the plan, the plan. What is your plan? Have you found a job? Are you going to graduate school? Where do you see yourself in 20 years? It will seem like no one cares about what you do so much as where you end up. And you will start to wonder whether you shouldn't care either. But beware, careerism in the wrong way is cynicism in perpetual motion. And before donor services drag me off the stage, let me clarify what I'm saying here. <laughs> I am not telling you to reject that job offer and move into your parents' basement. <laughs> what I'm saying is, wherever you end up, the work itself is the reward. Treat it that way. Because the truth is, life can put your best laid plans through the paper shredder. You may never get that dream job, or if you do get that dream job, it may turn out to be a nightmare. But maybe you're meant to do something else. What seems to you like catastrophe could end up becoming opportunity. Don't be so quick to dismiss that opportunity if it doesn't fit into the plan. When you come back and you see a fork in the road, you're probably deciding between two paths. Instead of thinking, how do I stay on course, think to yourself, where can I do the most good? Where do I get real fulfillment? If you realize it is a detour, then take it. That in a nutshell is basically my advice. It'd be rude to give a three minute commencement address, so let me just proceed to elaborate. <laughs> when I was your age, I had a plan. 1992, seems like yesterday, doesn't it? <laughs> doesn't, does it? <laughs> I had a plan. I thought I had it figured out. I knew exactly where I, what I wanted to do. I wanted to be an economist. That just goes to show you uh, how much fun I was in those days. <laughs> the plan was work in finance for a few years, in public finance, get some experience, go to grad school, get my PhD, join a think tank, give policymakers advice, or, or move to Milwaukee and work for an economics firm like R.W. Baird. A few years in, everything was going according to my plan. I was working in economic policy. I was getting ready for grad school. And then life intervened. The congressman who represented my home district decided to run for the Senate. I think his daughter went to Carthage. He asked me to be his campaign manager. I said, that's just not my thing. I'm a policy guy, not a political guy. He said, in that case, you should run for my seat. I said, run for your seat? That's crazy. I'm 27 years old. He asked me, why not? I said, I told him I was young. No way could I win. 
It wasn't my plan. He said, you know, if I listened to all the people who told me what I could not do, I would never have gotten anything done in my life. What do you care about? What do you believe in? I told him I believed in the principles of our founding fathers. I love public policy because I wanted to solve problems. Well, that's what he needed to hear. He said, then run. I still wasn't convinced. I called my mentor. I lost my father when I was a kid, so I grew up with mentors. One of my best mentors was a guy named Jack Kemp. He was a congressman from New York. I asked him, what do you think? Should, should, I, should I do this? Should I try this? He said, absolutely. You can make a huge difference. You're a Wisconsinite, but you're a public policy guy. Go do it. I called another mentor of mine, a guy named Bill Bennett. I asked, does this pass the laugh test? He said, yes, barely. <laughs> Actually, he was quite encouraging. Uh, then I called my mom, and I told her what I was thinking. She thought I was crazy. <laughs> you would really want to do that? So ultimately, I ran, and I won. But soon, I had another plan. Soon I realized in the House of Representatives where I wanted to go, where I wanted to carve uh, my space and make my difference. The issues I cared so much about, the issues my employers here in the First District were telling me they wanted me to work on, were the issues in front of the House Ways and Means Committee. Tax reform, economic growth, jobs, health care, retirement security, poverty. My goal was to become the chairman of that committee because I thought I could be a huge asset or I could at least make a big difference in these areas that I cared so much about. So I worked for years to achieve that goal. And finally, last year in 2015, I did. I became the chairman of that committee. Seven months in, Speaker of the House John Boehner resigned unexpectedly. The next guy in line, who I just assumed would be the next guy, a guy named Kevin McCarthy, dropped out of the running. And my colleagues drafted and asked me to run. I never wanted to be speaker. I had said no in uncertain terms many times before. I was a policy guy. I didn't like the idea of spending my time on other things. I live with my family in Janesville. Every weekend I'm here with my family. Yesterday it was turkey hunting and track meet and then dinner at my mom's. Today, here in Kenosha with you. I couldn't give those weekends up, but John told me, if you don't like the job, then change it. Keep your weekends at home. Focus on policy. Make it work. Turn it around. So I took advice. I soon realized that I could do this. I actually liked the job. Now I feel like the dog that caught the car who was never chasing it in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> and you see, we have something in common as well. At the beginning of your senior year, I also did not know what I would be doing after graduation. <laughs> This job isn't anything I ever expected or even thought I wanted. And yet, I'm still doing what I love, public policy. I learned eventually in my journey that public policy was my vocation. Public service is where I found my fulfillment. Through all the twists and the turns, that has been consistent, the consistent theme of my life. Now, you have to go out and figure what is yours. It may change as you get older. The only way you're going to find out is if you take your work seriously. It's your contribution to our con country. Now, when I, meet, when I say this, I'm not saying that your work is what you get paid for. Your work is all of your responsibilities, like your family, your friendships, your community. It's funny. But as life gets more complicated, it also gets a whole lot simpler as well. Status will, member, will matter a whole lot less. Doing your part will matter more. So don't worry too much about the plan. I was, I was, as I was thinking about these remarks, I had sort of a mild panic attack that my advice wasn't sufficiently practical. So for good measure, let me put it in a quick three-part postscript. First, a lot of people are going to tell you, don't fear failure, but learn from it. That's a great piece of advice. I would also say that you need to forgive it, too. You will make mistakes, but so will other people. 
your friends, your coworkers, your family. Don't sweat the small stuff. Take it in stride. It's good life advice. It's also good professional advice. Nobody likes a Debbie Downer. Nobody likes somebody that is lecturing all the time. There are lots of young, talented, smart, hardworking, ambitious people in society, you among them. Attitude's everything. Attitude's everything. Have a good attitude. Be an uplifter. Fill the glass. Don't take from the glass. Second, read as much as is humanly possible. Seriously. You know, John Adams once wrote to his son, he said, you will never be alone with a poet in your pocket. I was always more of a history and economics guy. Lesson still applies. The greatest asset you have is your mind, but it really is like a muscle. You have to keep it in shape. Don't forget that. You come out of college, you're like, whew, I don't have to read any of that stuff anymore. <laughs> don't. Third, if you're a believer, keep going to church. If you're a believer, keep going to church. Don't let that fall by the wayside. I know that might sound a little preachy, might sound even a little cheesy. You don't have to make a big show of it. Just go. Prayer has sustained me. It has sustained me in many difficult moments of my life. I think it's going to do the same for you. Because as you get older, you will realize that life, it actually does follow a plan. It just may not be your plan. It's God's plan. And coming to accept that fundamental fact, not coming to accept that fundamental fact begrudgingly, but peacefully, that is the essence of faith. You might not be able to make all the changes you wanted. The question is, did you make a difference wherever you could? Did you meet the moment? Did you look yourself in the mirror that morning or that evening and think, yeah, okay, I'm doing this the right way? Are you endeavoring to be fulfilled and to be a good person? in all of your aspects, all of your works of life. So if you remember one word from this speech, let it be faith. That should be all the planning that you need. May God bless you and keep you in his care. Congratulations once again, and thank you very much.